You look good, and we're glad to have you here tonight. I want to talk about kind of a, a controversial subject, and I want to talk about how do you honor authority when you get mixed messages? How many know that as believers, we're called to honor authority? And sometimes we get mixed messages. Sometimes, um, you know, like, you know like, like right now, we're going through a time when um, the government is asking us not to gather. But scripture will tell us that not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. But the Bible tells us we're to honor authority. So we, we get these mixed messages. We, we get the message where we're encouraged not to sing as a part of a spiritual community uh, but the Bible is full of over a hundred references where we're encouraged to sing and to shout and to praise the Lord. And we're instructed and commanded to do these things. And, and you, you get these kind of messages. And, and one of the places where people often go, and there's several references like this, but one of them is Romans chapter 13. And this is about honoring authority. And, and, and I just kind of want to um, kind of walk us through this a little bit, if, if, if that's okay. Because how many know that as believers, if we'll trust God, God will guide us through challenging times. So the scripture says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinances of God, and those who resist will bring judgment to themselves. So this scripture is telling us that we're to honor authority. So, so the question then becomes, are we to honor authority in every time and in every situation? When you think about that. Do we honor authority in every time and every situation because this passage of scripture has been used sometimes to create a stumbling block for people? And I want to break that down. So let me say it this way. For every mile of truth, there are two miles of ditch. Come on, say that again. For, for every truth in God's word, you, you can get into either ditch. Hello, somebody. You know, there, there, of course, when we're talking about authority, there's the one ditch of, of, of anarchy. This is, this is the person who resists all authority on the extreme. I'm talking about the extreme. It, it, it's, 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 the anarchists resist all authority, all established rule and order. And, and, and you're here, and most of us, we wouldn't consider ourselves anarchists. But I've met a lot of Christians who've got some anarchy in them. Come on, somebody. They, 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 I, don't tell me what to do. They, they, got a, they got a little problem with authority. Maybe not extreme, but, but still, they would probably lean towards that Anarchy. If, if, if you're going to ask me to do something, I'm going to rebel just because you asked me to do it. If you say go left, I want to go right just because you said we should go left. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? There are some people, it doesn't matter what authority asks, they want to go the other way. But then you got the other extreme of extreme patriotism. And that we're always to completely obey authority regardless of what is asked of us. I just want you to know that was the argument that was used, extreme patriotism, that was the argument that was used at the Nuremberg trials when they were using that argument for Nazis to justify what they did to Jews. And one of the judges dismissed that argument and said, but gentlemen, is there not authority or a law higher than our laws? So I'm suggesting to you, there are times we have to navigate what, how do I walk this thing out? Because in our own history, Rosa Parks, if she would have honored authority, would have gotten off of the bus and gave up her seat. But how many know that was an authority that needed to be 
challenged. Or had Martin Luther not wrote his 95 Theses, we would not have brought forth the great Reformation that we know today. Or William Wilberforce had not challenged the English government to end and abolish slavery. So how do I navigate this thing? I really want to try to help you because because I, I, I live in that tension. I live in that tension of I want to honor authority. I'm wired to honor authority. I'm called to honor authority. We're called to honor that. And so this teaching is not about COVID. It's teaching is not about mass. It's teaching is not about public gathering. It's teaching is about understanding how to unlock this passage of Scripture so that I understand how, how does God want me to honor authority. But let me, let me just give you some Scripture examples, actually several of them. In, in, in Exodus chapter 1 is the story of the Hebrew wives, the Hebrew midwives. They were instructed by the king. These are examples in Scripture of civil disobedience because remember, God says honor authority because they're, authority exists and we should humbly honor authority because I'll get to it in just a moment but authority was created for our good but the midwives were instructed by Pharaoh the king that whenever the Israeli or the Jewish women would give birth to a male child they were instructed to destroy the child but the midwives refused to do that and the king called them. It's like, I gave you a clear directive. And they made up some excuses. Says, well, you know, the, 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 the Jewish women, they're really lively. So by the time I get there, by the time we get there, they've already given birth to the child. So they're directly defined. And here's what the Bible says. Therefore, God dealt with, well with the midwives. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. So there's a mixed message here. In Joshua chapter 2 is the story of a woman. Her name is Rahab, and, and she was known to be a prostitute. And when Israel was getting ready to invade the city of Jericho, they sent spies in, and these spies went into her house, and the king knew that they were there or had been there, and he set it says, where are the men who came into your house? And she lies. She says, they're not here. They have left, but she's hiding them. And after the king leaves and his army leaves, she helps them escape down a window. And you and I would look at this woman, her status in life and position in life, and we would say she's a mess. But God said she was special. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says, By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish by those who did not believe. When she received the spies with what? Peace. She received with peace. So she's in defiance of a direct order, but she's receiving something with peace. In Kings is a story of a, of a person who worked for government. His name was Obadiah. And he worked for this wicked king named Ahab and his terrible wife named Jezebel and Jezebel she hated God's people and she was on her personal crusade to destroy them and she had been having God's leaders and God's prophets destroyed and Obadiah even though he's working for the king he goes and finds a hundred of God's prophets puts them in two different caves and brings them food and water and he's saying that I did this because I fear God. What he's saying is, I recognize your authority, but I also recognize a higher authority. He's still working in his position, but he's not carrying out their order to destroy people's lives. I don't know if I'm helping you. I'm just trying to give you, I want you to understand Scripture. Because, see, Romans 13 has been used in the 60s during the civil rights movement by churches to shame civil rights workers for fighting for equal justice and says, you're defying God's order of things. Are you understand what I'm trying to say? And that's the misunderstanding of Scripture. So we have to understand how to not get into anarchy 
or lean into being rebellious. And we also have to understand how not to become uh, extreme patriots and, and get into blind obedience. But God, how do you want me to interpret this? And in this book of Daniel are two great examples. There are three Hebrew children who are high-ranking government officials, by the way. Their names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the king makes this golden image and says, I'm going to play music. And when I play music, everyone is to bow down and worship this image. Well, when the music plays, everybody goes down, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So we're not going down. The king is furious. It's like, did I not issue a decree? Yeah, you did. Okay, we're going to try this one more time. I'm going to play the music one more time because I kind of like you guys, but you got me really mad right now. And I'm going to play this music one more time and you got to bow or I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. Play the music. Music plays. Boom, everybody goes down. Shadrach, me said, they're still standing there. I'm not going down. We're not going down. And here's what the response was. Shadrach, me and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. In other words, we serve a higher authority. And he has, he's greater than you. You're powerful. He's more powerful. But, but, but if not, if he doesn't save us, let it be known to you, O king, we will not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. Listen carefully. These three people are not anarchists. Their nature is not defiant. In fact, they are flourishing in their leadership roles in the kingdom. But they're not extreme patriots. They're not blindly obeying. They're saying, look, we're not a threat to you, but we're not going to bow. A couple chapters later, there's a Daniel who's the author of this book. He has some political adversaries. The king loves Daniel. Oh, by the way, back Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, after they went into the fire, you know the story, they come out, the fourth one, they come out of the fire, the king promotes them. They even went higher in their authority. They, they were promoted in their authority. They grew in authority even though they had a risk resisted authority. Oh, I don't know if you're understanding what I'm trying to say. And I, anyway, just trying to help you navigate complex issues. We're going someplace with this. Just hang in there. In Daniel chapter 6, Daniel is well liked by the king. The king was thinking about how he can continue to work with Daniel because Daniel was doing such a good job for him. But Daniel had political adversaries. And these political adversaries said, how can we... How can we deal with Daniel? How can we mess with Daniel? And here's how we'll mess with him. We'll make a law, we'll convince the king to make a law that would come against his faith. And so they talked the king into writing this law that no one could pray to their God for 30 days. The only person they could pray to was the king who was taught and per perceived as a God himself. So you're the only God people can pray to. So they make this law which is the law of the Medes and Persians, which the scripture says cannot be changed, altered, or broken. So they make this law. They, they trick the king into signing this law. And, and, and it says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. So the law just gets passed. He goes home. He went to the upper room with the window open, open towards Jerusalem. He knelt down on his knees three times that day, and he prayed gave thanks before God, as was his custom from early days. You catch this. A law was just enacted. And Daniel says, I'm going to continue to pray. As a result, now let, you got to understand this. Daniel now defies government. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego defied the government. And as a result, Daniel goes into the lion's den. Come on, somebody. There are consequences. So Daniel goes into the lion's den. Well, of course, he's not devoured by the lions. The next morning, the king's like, oh, great. I didn't want to throw you in there anyway. But they, they tricked me. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take all the people who made me write that stupid law, and I'm going to throw them into the lion's den. No, no, listen carefully. Listen carefully. 
Because you also find the same kind of example in the book of Esther when there was a terrible man by the name of Haman who built a gallows to hang his adversary and to try to eliminate the Jewish people through genocide. He died on his own gallows. Be careful when you use your authority, if you, whatever authority you have, be careful when you use your authority to do harm with your authority. Be careful of your authority when you use your authority to do harm to the righteous because God is the defender of the righteous. In the New Testament, the disciples make this powerful statement. In Acts, in Acts chapter 4, they had been arrested, beaten, and threatened by the same people, by the way, who had killed Jesus. And they make this powerful statement, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. I know, this brings up an issue, huh? So, so I go through all these stories in Scripture, and this is not in your notes, but, but, but this is something, what are the consequences, or what's the conclusion, if you what, what's the conclusion? Let me just give you three quick thoughts. You might want to write these down. Here, here's the first one. Here's the first one. Anytime you're asked by authority to do evil to another person, you're to resist that authority. When authority asked the midwives to kill children, they said, we can't do that. When Obadiah was asked to turn in the prophets so that they could be executed, he said, I can't do that. So he resisted authority when the authority was asking him to do evil. That did not happen in Nazi Germany but that's an example we resist. Here's the second thing. We're permitted to resist authority. We're permitted dis civil disobedience when that authority asks us to disregard, disobey God's laws and God's commands. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says, we are not disloyal to you, king, but you can't take our worship away from us. Daniel said, I'm not disloyal to you, king, I'm not an anarchist, I'm not resisting you, but you cannot take my faith away from me. You cannot take my belief and my hope in God away from me. Here's the third thing you have to realize though. When you do disobey, scripture teaches us that we receive the consequences, we accept the consequences, and we suffer with dignity as we honor Christ. We put on Christ. I'll read a scripture in a moment later. In other words, if you're driving down the road and the speed limit is 35 and you're driving 55 and they pull you over and give you a ticket, don't argue. Just say thank you. <laughs> All right, you're looking at me all funny. <laughs> Come on. Say, I don't say thank you. Yeah, no, if, if, because you recognize the authority. You still honor the authority, but you say, because here's why. To help us understand Romans chapter 13, we have to understand the levels of authority and if I understand the levels of authority and how those authorities apply in my life, then all of a sudden I can understand Romans 13 in the proper context. Let me just walk you through these really quickly. The highest level of authority, if I want to practice honoring of authority and, and deal with a mixed message, is the highest level of authority is God's authority. Scripture says this in Philippians. In Philippians, and, and, and we're talking about as, as believers, as Christians. It says, therefore God exalted him, speaking of Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So listen carefully. As believers, we recognize there is a God. We recognize and understand there is God. And as believers, we're saying he's the ultimate authority. Now, whether you recognize it or not, doesn't take his authority away. Let me say it again. The authority exists. To, authority simply means the right to rule. It's the right to rule. And God is the highest authority because he has the highest right to rule. So when I'm looking to understand authority, I've got to first understand and look through God's eyes understanding authority. What's the purpose of authority? You might want to write some of these things down. There's, there's many purposes, but here are a couple I'll mention to you. One of the purposes of authority is to create order, to create order, especially order out of chaos. Bible talks about when God created the heavens and the earth, he hovered over the earth 
which was without form and void. In other words, if you understood that, it literally was a chaotic mess when God began to speak creation into order. How many know that creation has an order to it? Days have an order to them. Seasons have an order to them. Because where there's disorder, it's where the devil flourishes. Crisis flourishes. Pain flourishes. God is always about trying to take the craziness of our life and bring order to it. And one of the roles of authority is to help create and establish order. Just like, just like creation has an order. We just went through a remodel on this building. And um, when we first moved in, we didn't have a fire system in the building. And every time we remodeled a new area of the building, that was one of the first things they requested we want you to add fire suppression. And we were glad to do it because the building was coming under a new order. As we remodeled it, it came under a new order. And this is what authority does. It, its purpose is to try to establish order. We don't always like that order, whether it's in environments or whether it's in, it's in uh, 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 building codes and building designs. It's all about trying to bring about an order that saves us from crazy or crisis. The other purpose of it is to protect us from threat. How, how many know that you know, the presence of authority suppresses lawlessness? Oh, come on. You don't tell me you don't check your speed limit when you're driving by a police officer? I mean, I mean, if, 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 there, if there's no police officer around, you might get a little lawless. You might drive a little fast. But the minute you see authority, it suppresses. In other words, the purpose of authority is to suppress evil from emerging. It brings out, it's meant to bring the best out of us, to keep the worst in us contained. And, and then the other part of authority is to bring punishment or bring justice when someone chooses to bring lawlessness and be lawlessness. But ultimately, and I'm talking about God's authority, scripture tells us that everyone will stand before his judgment. And it refers to us when we stand before his judgment, it's an interesting analogy. Do you know, do you know God refers to us as uh, either sheep or goats? Sheep are compliant and follow a shepherd. Goats are less compliant and don't follow a shepherd. Come on, somebody. But see, when Jesus judges us and his authority, and you have to understand, to understand God's ultimate authority and the purpose of authority, the purpose of authority is to do good. Not everybody who has authority does good with authority, but the purpose of authority is to do good. And so Jesus talks about in Matthew 25 that when there's this judgment and people are giving an account for themselves, he uses the analogy, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, the hospital, you visited me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. And that's how he uses his authority and his influence to do good. But here's one I want you to mention. Here's the second level of authority. And many people miss this next level of authority and they don't understand how it works the second level of authority. Now, when I, let me back up. When I talk about God's authority, I'm talking about God's authority revealed through his word. God's authority revealed to his word. But the second level of authority is the authority of our conscience. Our conscience is the second level of authority. And I need to take a minute and walk you through this. Look, look what the scripture says here in Romans. In, in Romans uh, 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 chapter two, it says, even Gentiles, that would be unbelievers in Paul's writing here, says even Gentiles who do not have God's law or God's word written in their hearts will show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it. Watch it again. They will know his law. Even, they don't know it, but they know it instinctively when they obey it. Even without having heard it, they demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own, watch this, their own conscious and thoughts either accuse them and tell them they are doing right. In other words, here's what this scripture is saying. 
that my conscience is a law unto me. In fact, it's the second level of authority in my life. God's authority and then my conscience is in my life. And the Bible says my conscience will either accuse me or else it will agree with me. So your conscience, watch this, is this inner world on the inside of you. It's, it's, it's this intuitions. It's these guts, feelings. It's these promptings. It's, it's part of your inner worlds. And not everybody's in t- in connected and in tune with this the way they need to be. But it's a powerful resource. So just, just hang in there with me. Here's what the scripture says, because it, be, it becomes a place where the Holy Spirit wants to impress upon you. Here's what the scripture says in Romans. It's not in your outline, but in Romans, in Romans, chapter, in Romans chapter 9 and verse 1, Paul says, I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bears me witness. My conscience is bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit is impressing upon me. And here's, here's, here's the dilemma I'm trying to help you walk through. As we're walking through the challenges of COVID and we're walking through the challenges of this time and season in our life, we're walking through the challenges that you'll face in life. What is, what is God's word saying to me and what's being asked of me by others and what is my conscience saying to me as I try to navigate all of these things? Because here's the goal that you want to cultivate inside of yourself is a pure conscience or a clean and clear conscience. Here's what Paul says in Acts 23, verse 1. He says, Paul looking earnestly at the council and said, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience. I have lived in all good conscience until this day. And Chapter later in 24, verse 16, he says, so I strive always to keep my conscience clear before what God and man. Ultimately, keeping our conscience clear is one of the ways we recognize authority. And John chapter eight is the story of these men who were off. They'd just gotten off and they brought this woman to Jesus and they were trying to accuse Jesus and get her stoned because she had committed adultery. And Jesus began to not say anything and they're talking and finally begins to write in the sand and finally says he was without sin, let him throw the first stone. And he goes on, here's what the scripture says. And, and those, when they had heard this, he says, whoever's without sin, you go ahead and throw the stone. Being convicted where? Where were they convicted? In their conscience. They were convicted in their conscience. And they one by one beginning Uh, from the oldest to the last, and Jesus was left alone with the woman. Here's what I'm trying to say to you. These men were moving in a direction that was about to be a huge mistake in their life, and their conscience stopped them, moved them in a different direction. Let me ask you this question. Has your conscience ever stopped you as you were moving down a direction? Come on, church. See, what I'm talking about, when we're talking about, here here it comes, when we're talking about civil government, we're talking about government on the outside. When we're talking about man's authority, we're talking about authority on the outside. These first two levels of authority, they start with authority on the inside. They start with my relationship with God as the ultimate authority, and I accept his leadership in my life. And then it starts with my conscience to the best of my ability, God, when I don't know, I'm trying to have a pure conscience before you. And what, here's what Paul's saying. The Holy Spirit will witness to your conscience. The Holy Spirit will speak to your conscience. The Holy Spirit will try to teach your conscience. When you don't know God's will, the Holy Spirit will try to speak his will into your life and minister to you. And if you'll learn to recognize your conscience, if you'll learn to recognize those promptings, you'll save yourself from messing things up in your life. How, how many, how, let me flip it around. How many times have you not listened to your conscience? And your conscience was like yelling at you, don't do it, don't do it, don't, don't. And what did you do? You did it anyway. And then all of a sudden, you got guilt, 
you, you, you messed up, you've got problems, you've got challenges, and, 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 and you, you, you become defiant of your conscience. Because here's the thing, while God's authority is pure, our conscience, we try to fight for purity in our conscience, but if we're not careful, here's the warning, our conscience can become corrupted. Our conscience can become defiled. Look, look, look what Paul says, or, or uh, Scripture says here about our conscience being corrupted. First Timothy chapter two, or excuse me, First Timothy chapter four and verse two. Speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. How many know that when your conscience speaks to you, it pricks you. It just, it just pains you. It's like, it's, like, it's like this sharp thing that tries to speak to you. Think of it this way. If I had a butter knife and I had a razor sharp knife and I put the same pressure on my flesh somewhere or the same pressure on your flesh somewhere, how many know the pressure of the butter knife probably isn't gonna increase your pain? but the pressure of the razor knife is going to get you dancing. Same pressure, one is dulled. And if I'm not careful, my conscience can become dulled. It can get so covered up, so buried in the minutia, so caught up with so many things that the voice of my spirit and the voice of my conscience gets so buried in everything that I'm caught up in, that it's dulled, it's become wounded. Here's what Titus goes on to say. Titus chapter one, verse 15, it says, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience have become defiled, have become corrupted. It doesn't work right. It doesn't function right. See, when I, when I, when I, I can place myself to where my conscience allows me to start believing lies. So now my conscience isn't serving me well. That, this is something I need God's help and wisdom to understand. But I've got to recognize that bitterness can defile my conscience. Resentment can defile my conscience. Certain attitudes can defile my conscience. Let me ask you this question. Where do offensive people come from? Being offended. I'm going to tell you right now. Where do people who are hurtful come from? People have been hurt. And we don't realize we deal with their external behavior, but often don't realize something went on in their life. Same is true for you. I got to realize that if I'm, I got to be careful with the bitterness in my life because it'll damage my conscience. I've got to be careful with the wounds in my life, the traumas in my life because it'll damage my conscience. I got to be careful with the hurts in my life. It'll damage my conscience. I got to be careful with certain things because if I'm not, if I don't, if I'm not careful, my conscience no longer stays pure and my conscience can become corrupted and now I can start believing a lie. So the first level of authority is God's ultimate authority and we all give account to that. The second level of authority is my conscience and I've got to fight for that. And here's the scripture I was talking about a minute ago. If, if I choose to live in this inner world, if I choose to live out my inner world, then I have to accept the consequences when I disobey authority. And, and here's what the Bible says in 1 Peter. In 1 Peter uh, chapter 2 and verse 19, it says, For God is pleased, watch this, for God is pleased when conscious of the will, his will, we patiently endure unjust treatment. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you're beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. For God, call, watch this, God called you to do good even if it means suffering. God called you to do good even if it means suffering. Just as Christ suffered for you, he is your example and you must follow his steps. Did Jesus deserve the treatment that he got from the authority that was around he did not deserve it, but how did he handle it? He endured it. He suffered with dignity. The three Hebrew children says, we're not going to bow 
And if it means we go into the furnace, we go into the furnace. Daniel says, I'm not going to stop praying, even if it means I go into the lion's den. Here's what I'm saying. If you choose to follow God and you choose to follow your conscience, don't blame anybody. If you choose to follow your God and you choose to follow your conscience, don't be a victim. If you choose to, to disobey, then you accept the consequences of whatever authorities are established and you suffer with dignity, you endure it because this is pleasing to God. We model to the world that we're not victims. So, won't, so if you choose to take a path in these troubling times, don't raise your fist and rail at the government and say, this is the government. That's not God's kingdom principles. It's, this is the course I'm taking. This is what God's word says. This is what my conscience says. This is the course I'm taking. Here's the third level of authority. That's, that's man's authority. We, we read this first one in Romans a minute ago. It says, let every soul be subject to the governing of the authorities for there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. In other words, this is external authorities now and they're created actually in God's goal for external authorities, civil governments, husband, wife authority, parent, child authority, boss, employee authority. His role for authority is that that authority would do good. Here's what Hebrews says. Here's what Hebrews says. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls. There's those who must give an account, let them do so with joy and not with grief for this would be unprofitable for you. So in other words, the purpose of authority is for us to do good. The purpose of authority is to help us. I really believe our government is trying to help us right now. I really believe our government is trying to help us. At the same time, at the same time, I also cannot ask you not to sing. I can't ask you not to do that. At the same time, I can't ask you not to gather because God's word says. Those are the dilemmas. Because to do so, I would have to defy his word and I have to defy my conscience. But I honor I don't know if I'm helping anybody here. I don't know if I'm helping anybody. Might be making some people mad. See, here, here's what's coming from. I, I, I'm going to make those on the one side mad, and I'm going to make those on the other side mad. So if I make people mad on both sides, I'm probably where I need to be. Come on, somebody. But this is where the authority that you have is to do good. And it's authority that's contextual. This is what I mean that you have to recognize. It, to understand Romans 13, you have to understand the context of authority. Let me give you this example and then we'll, then we'll pray. If I'm driving down the road and I leave church here tonight and there's an accident, and on this accident, someone is hurt. And at the scene, there is a police officer, there's a doctor, and there's me as a pastor, which the Bible says I'm a spiritual leader. Who has authority in that situation, in the context of that situation? In the traffic, in the street, the officer takes control to create a safe zone. The doctor steps in because the police has created the safe zone. The doctor steps in to try to save the life. And I stand on the corner and pray. God, save, heal, open hearts, protect, bring your grace. I don't, unless the officer asks me to help in the street, that's not my lane. Unless the doctor asks me to help with the patient, that's not my lane. It's not my authority. But I do have an authority. And in this house, I have an authority. I gotta watch out for your souls. Because I have to give an account for that. And I cannot in all good conscience ask you not to sing. But I believe COVID is real. And I know personally, personally know how dangerous it can be. I'm in a dilemma. I'm in a dilemma. I know we need to worship God to be emotionally, mentally, spiritually strong. I know it's not good for people when they don't gather spiritually, emotionally, mentally, but I also know it's difficult.
because we're trying to stop the spread of a disease. God, I need your wisdom because I watch out for your souls and I have to give an account for that. But let me ask you this. Have you submitted your life to Christ? Have you said yes to him? Have you said, God, I put my trust in you? Is there an area of your life that you need to say, God, I'm surrendering this area so that my conscience can be cleansed, so that my walk with you can be right? I just want to pray over you. I just want you to close your eyes. If you're watching online, just, just create an environment of worship. If you're driving, keep your eyes open, please. But I just want you to tune in to his voice right now. Tune into his spirit as I begin to pray over you. Because my job is to create a place where God can do his job in your life. I've taught you his word. Church, thank you so much for joining us today. I pray that the Word of God was an encouragement to you. And that's what we're here for. We're here to bring God's Word in a way to bring His hope and inspiration into your life. But I also want to encourage you that you can be an inspiration to us, an encouragement to me. One of the ways you can do that is by becoming a part of our online community and subscribing to our YouTube channel. That way you get to stay connected. You can also continue to follow us and be a part of our live services when they're broadcast. And when you do that, 
Make sure you're commenting. We want to hear where you're from. We want to hear what God is doing in your life and how the word is encouraging you. That is such an encouragement. Seems like a little thing, but it does matter when you hit like and share. And then, of course, your generosity is an incredible encouragement. So I just want to say thank you so much, and I pray that we're being an encouragement to you because you certainly are an encouragement to me here at Capitol. Love you guys.